Hello everyone, it's Sonia McDonald here from Leadership HQ. And as you know, every week I have been speaking with and, and sharing and having wonderful discussions with incredible founders, CEOs, uh, startups, managing directors all across Australia who are really passionate about leadership and also really passionate to inspire and support others during this time with their insights and stories. And really excited to be speaking with Frankie today, who is the co-founder of, we were just talking about it offline, uh, he's got a great story to share because their company is growing, um, Hybury, and they were in the AFR top 100 fastest growing, it's fastest, wasn't it? Fastest growing companies. So welcome, Frankie, to the Thank live stream. And um, I'm glad that i um, named after your cat. That's uh, <laughs> a great, great, great honour of mine. <laughs> well, my cat is beautiful. I was just saying, um, Frankie, I've got a cat called Frankie. He's a rag doll. And he's the most beautiful, affectionate cat. So I was very happy to be actually speaking to a Frankie uh, on our leadership channel today. So so welcome. So tell us, tell us about your journey and how Hybrid um, um, started and everything. Tell us all about yeah. it. Yeah, sure. So, look, I mean, it started in 2013, really, where a Coca-Cola company in Atlanta uh, went out to the industry, um, the startup industry, trying to look at, um, trying to tap into startup thinking. So the, the, the background to that really is that um, Mutar Kent, who's the CEO of Coke at that time, um, was pitched the six ideas from um, emerging talent uh, within the organization. And every every large organization has this. It's like a it's a uh, leadership program um, where they, they pick young guy, you know, people in in the organization who have potential to become leaders in the organization. And this is one of the programs that they were running at Coke. And uh, and so they did that. And for several years, and these teams would come up from globally because you think of people in Japan and Korea, Coca's everywhere, and, and 192 two countries globally. And so quite an investment by the Coca-Cola company to in, in, um, sort of uh, in, uh, enrich and support their young, talented uh, folks. So this, this program in particular, at the end, um, the idea was that they pitch an idea, an innovative idea, these leaders were pitching an innovative idea to, to Muta Kent and the, and the operating uh, committee there. Um, and um, and, and um, they do this. And so at this particular time, there were... Uh, eight ideas pitched to them uh, and six were already in play in the organization as you can imagine coke is big so you know brazil could be working on something similar to the what's been pitched they they have no insight and the other two were asking for a basically a business case but an investment of over a million dollars for an idea that has never been tested or proven or validated okay and and said this is what we do at um, Coke, is that we, we make assumptions based on, a, you know, if you look at any business plan, you will see there's a whole what, what, what the idea is and uh, what it's going to solve, how it's going to return on investment. But at the end of it, you'll see all these assumptions. And that's what a business case is. There's an assumption of what would likely to happen. But mm -hmm. a startup challenges those assumptions at the beginning, not at the end. So what happens okay. with incorporate? Yeah, corporates, when they start with innovations, typically would um, start with assumptions, build, and then prove it out. So they'll build a million-dollar solution, then say, oh, it didn't work or worked, okay, or well, maybe run a pilot. A startup works the opposite way. It, it, it has at least has, has an idea, but also these assumptions, they will experiment quickly to validate before investing time and energy into it. So it's a different type of uh, tackling the problem in a different way. One goes much more uh, like a, bot a bottom-up, the other one's a top-down approach. Top-down being corporate, business case, uh, give me money, and I'll try to prove it to you. The other one is, um, don't give me money. Let me prove it to you. Then give me money, which is all about why people, you know, and I'm pitching to VCs and so forth because they've proven traction. Anyway, and so Muta Ken in the operating committee there said, look, this is what we do always. It has to be a new way. And the new way is why well, can, and at that time you probably recall that uh, uh, Facebook actually acquired uh, link, um, acquired uh, Instagram for like eight, uh, um, one one. $1 billion, I think it was, after 18 months. Um, and this is how could companies with, you know, eight people in, in the course of 18 months generate so much value so fast without min minimal? They didn't spend millions of dollars. They spent, you know, next to nothing. <clears throat> and so let's, and he said, let's look into uh, applying a startup mentality to our corporate yeah. ventures. 
And so, and they said, well, and this program started with, um, and David Butler was heading it up. He's a, you know, um, he's head of design at that time, then moved into entrepreneurship. So we went out and sourced um, entrepreneurs to come into the organization. And our our job was uh, a, basically a formula. And they, they actually piloted it in Australia. Sydney was a pilot. So in Coke, um, in North Sydney, um, in New South Wales, um, Coca-Cola South Pacific is the operating arm for the Coca-Cola company in Atlanta. And it was driven out of that, they were experimenting. And that's what happens. So in, in ma majority of the time in large multinational companies, they can use one region, experiment and, ex and export it. And so like, you know, um, Shero Coke came out of Australia and it was experimented and then ex then ex uh, exported. Uh, so is Coke Zero, by the way, I think. Coke Zero is actually oh, really? the one. Yeah, yeah. Some of the, the, the I think the marketing, one, one particular marketing uh, campaign was actually um, came out of Australia and then they exported. Definitely the Powerade claim of 10% yeah. hydration faster. That came out of, that, that claim, marketing claim came out of Australia research. They experimented and then, then the other uh, Powerade um, uh, business units started using that, that claim. So anyway, back to the entrepreneurship and leadership and stuff. So they said, so let's let's look at startups and see if we can find some startups, entrepreneurs that are willing to join the company and use our assets and, and, and key problems and create a new business model. So our, our job description was quite simple. Coke's assets, startup thinking, equal a new business model. So they weren't interested in a new beverage or new campaign. They have 700,000 people doing that. They were interested in actually developing a new business model, uh, something that is adjacent and that leverages the Coke's uh, assets. So when I say assets, I'm talking about things like Coke has more UPS, uh, more trucks and UPS and FedEx combined. They have, um, 20, you know, they have uh, $17 billion brands. Um, their Facebook account alone is about 100 million. So that's like a whole population. You can create something for $1, you made already uh, um, a money out of that. So they were looking at how to leverage those assets. And so the area that, um, so, and so they were looking at entrepreneurs and we were arranged marriage. So Jason Hosking and my business partner and I were arranged marriage. Um, it took, uh, I think it was like four, four months interview process. There was a, a, a pitch challenge. There was psychographical assessment. There was a um, physical, um, the final four was in a collaborative, competitive um, interview process where we need to pitch ideas and so forth. And so a long story short, we were created. Um, I was more of a background, was design thinking and, um, and so forth. My business partner, business person uh, from X Macquarie. And so, so they joined us together and that was a model. And they started exporting that idea to other business units around the globe. So Tel Aviv came online, Silicon Valley, um, San Francisco, Mexico City. So they had two person teams, they're called hubs. This was all part of this program called Accelerator. Um, a Coca-Cola Accelerator program. So we uh, focused on the uh, assets of uh, data, which yeah. Coke and large organizations have. And we started uh, running these experiments. And one, one particular one ran with um, CSRO, Data61, which at that time was called NICTA. And we ran a sort of a hackathon, which is another innovation sort of, um, uh, I would say, approach, um, crowdsourcing ideas. And, and again, long story short, we found interesting IP and interesting talent. Um, we, you know, created a company without um, acquiring acquiring the uh, IP from the, uh, CSRO, uh, and then getting the one of the three of the uh, the data scientists to join the company. And here we are now, over from five people to over forty five, um, are scattered in Japan and uh, US in headquarters in Surrey Hills. Um, so it's been a wild journey. Um, uh, we have now three products. Um, large organizations and use our products like Coke and Walmart and, um, um, you know, la uh, big, big brands, big brands and use our, and we have these three products range from really focusing on, on if I had to summarize, uh, retail optimization. Okay. So for people out there that are obviously, I'm hoping they're all going to your website to check out a little bit more about you, what are the, what are the challenges that you're solving for customers? So when you talk about the fact that you're working for these large organizations, what are you doing to help them in terms of what is Hyvery doing to help with their challenges? So one of our products is called Hyvery Creates, so Curate, uh, and basically it curates um, plant grams uh, for, um, uh, for retailers and uh, manufacturers. So to so you understand, in the US in particular, um, the, the category management is basically uh, is 
is driven mostly by the brands, the CPGs. And uh, companies, uh, retailers like Walmart or Kroger's or Target, they actually outsource it to a category captain. Um, they will manage a category on behalf of even competitors. So Coke will be the category captain for beverages for a particular um, uh, category, such as you know soft drinks. And it will also include competitors like Pepsi. And so, so you can imagine this task, the reason why they do this is that it's quite time consuming. Um, and in fact, they call them relays, uh, meaning that um, the relay is basically um, a process by which they develop these planograms, which is basically a pentagram. So, you know, for the audience here is, is a picture of what that shelf should look like in that store. So, and if you can think about, there is over four thousand planograms for per, you know, for per category across the U.S. Um, for Walmart for the retailer. It takes them six months, thirty-three weeks. With our technology, it, it takes them six minutes to do. Not six months, six minutes. Um, and so, and plus, the, uh, we're using machine learning, you know, AI and operations research uh, to allow our users, which are like category managers and category advisors. Um, to actually run these scenarios and create planograms, um, which is um, uh, much faster, you know, six months, 33 weeks to, to um, six minutes, you know, minutes yeah. really. Um, um, and so so that, that's one product that we have. Another one is similar space in, um, in, um, in, in vending. So um, basically the sa it's the same problem. The problem is this in all the products we have is that, the space is very critical in retail. Um, if you can imagine, it's costing the retail industry over $900 billion a year in optimizing space. Um, space, you, you imagine if you go to Woolies or Coles, you, your item there is out of stock or you don't have the right items that you're looking for. That, you imagine, it's a, uh, it's kind of, you would think that solved that problem, right? It's been around. But to be honest, the category management discipline has been around for about 15 years. It's quite new. And only recently they've had best practices applied. And so the technologies out there are unable to leverage that depth of data until machine learning, which can look at patterns differently. Um, and so what we solve is that space. So if you think about Coke, uh, I mentioned that Coke, Coke has 3,000 500 types of brands and container types. There's Fanta, yeah. there's Fanta in a glass, Fanta in a plastic, Fanta in a can, then there's Coke, there's Diet Coke, you know, the 3,500 3, types, right? How do you put it, what, what do you decide to put into a vending machine if you have that much choice or, or a shelf space for that matter? Yeah, That's, yeah at the moment, how they'll do it is um, based on sales, based on uh, 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 segmentation uh, information about segments. Yeah. Um, but when you use machine learning to find patterns and relationships that are quite complex. So an example would be that, you know, let's say a Safeway in the US is amongst an affluent community. And you mm -hmm. assume, logical assume that that store will stock much more affluent good brands in that Safeway, you know, the top, top brands. But turns out that the people who are buying it, it's not them, that the majority. It's, it's the people that, it's the um, people that support um, the affluent people. It's the car yeah. wash guy. It's the lawn guy that goes out and cleans that and it goes into a local um, uh, Safeway and yeah. buys that drink and stuff. So you, so, but, 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 but the industry will say, no, that's because it's affluent and using human constructs. Because of an affluent community, we're going to make sure that that store has affluent type of products, you know, branded yeah. products. But the real fact is, is that who's purchasing is different. And so what we have used is machine learning to find out what is actually being purchased at individual stores and start customizing for those stores, not for demographics, yeah. which is already embedded in the data itself. So That's let's do that. In Pardon, Frankie? Oh, so I'm saying we, we do that as well in vending machines. So, you know, so what, what a, you know, um, it's like, the, when you buy a book on Amazon, which uses a recommender system, is machine learning cap, uh, uh, branch of machine learning. Um, you know, you, Sonia, you're in, I don't know where you are, in Sydney? or, or Brisbane. Brisbane. Oh, great. The city that likes to lock down out, uh, other states. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> we want, I want you in here. <laughs> we want you in here. Yeah, anyways. <laughs> 
Yeah. I'm kidding. And I, I look, you, you gotta you gotta protect your citizens. So I think it's it's all it's all it's 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 a kind of you know I see I see the rationale. Nevertheless, um, you know, you might be in, uh, you, you're in Brisbane or you know Queensland. I'm in Sydney. If you buy a book on cheese, and it, and uh, the the algorithm has learned that people who buy books on cheese also like books on coffee. Okay. Now, if I buy a book on cheese. It's going to recommend coffee for me, right? Because it's a learn association. If you buy a book on cheese, what do you reckon, Sonia? It's going to recommend wine, books on wine. No, on, on coffee. Remember? No, no, no. Oh, that's, that's, no, no. I was just saying, like, but I would, I, I get it, like, which is cool around the coffee. I understand, but I'd also think it would also what wine books do. Yeah. yeah. Wine and <laughs> Yeah, it will learn what what that in that scenario when you bought a book on um, wine, it would recommend something like glasses relating to wine, uh, like true glasses. Yes. But in this case, you are, assuming that you, you, I'm just saying you probably won't buy a book on cheese. But but if it's learned that um, when you buy when people buy a book on cheese, there's a relationship with for some reason on coffee, and so it would recommend coffee to you. And he goes, oh yeah, for some for some reason, we'll rec there's a relationship, and so it doesn't care that Sonia, you're in in Queensland or I'm in in New South Wales, and or I'm male, you're female. It doesn't care about demographics or location. It knows there's a relationship between the products, and that's what we've done. That's the same technology wow. we've applied. It has a relationship with the product. So, and I'll give you a, a a real example of a case study. Um, there's um there's a store uh we were running this al algorithm for uh, coke around vending machines in um, um optimizing vending machines for for coke uh in, in the us and our recommendation said for this particular vending machine do um putting coke at school and and in us you're not allowed to put in sugar drinks in vending machines at in high schools or primary schools and that's it's a rule it's a rule um you know sugar and so forth but this particular one, it said go recommended, and then we were concerned because we felt uh, our algorithms were not, not behaving right. It wasn't behaving to the rules because we can actually feature engineer rules to it. So do not recommend the ideal product, but do not put in. So we the we were concerned because they might compromise other recommendations. So we went out to the school uh, school in Santa Monica, uh, San, San, um, Sacramento. I remember, and we asked the janitor there, "Where is this 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 particular vending machine location?" You know, say, "Oh, he says in that room there." We opened that room and saw it in the back corner. It's in the teacher's lounge, which is is mimicking a business. Yeah, and it was totally fine. That was totally fine. So the system was correct. The algorithms were correct. Another example in the in the in the category management space. Um, we, we now use demand transfer, which is a new feature of our product that determines cannibalization. Um, you know, what if you remove a product or add a product, what's the impact to that category uh, other products would be? We can tell you which product by ranking order will be either increasing revenue or decreasing. So you can actually see which products. Um, and we ran this stuff again, um, and there was one particular store, store uh, 1956, that's the code name of this store, in, in, it's in yeah. Arkansas. And it said, um, if you were to remove uh, Miller's Core 30 pack of beer, people yeah. would transfer to a single serve Cobra beer, Cobra King Cobra beer. What is King Cobra beer? And why would they go to a single serve? Like, why would somebody buy, you know, if you're a regular beer drinker and you got your 30 can, why would you go for a single service if that 30 can? Why wouldn't you go to something similar, you know, to a, like a Miller's Core 30 something different, right? But it said it would go into a single serve uh, majority, and we said this back to our client, uh, the brewing company that we work with. Um, you know what's happening here, um, and they said, "Ah, oh, that particular store, I know why. Turns out that store, uh, it's a Walmart store that actually sells also gas, and outside of the gas, there's a whole range of Cobra, uh, King Cobra beers, single serves outside." Like outside, not outside of the thing, but outside of the store. So, so when people are saying, "Oh, that's not there," they end up buying these copper beers right out there because it's front of the eye, basically. Yeah. Uh, it was a bestseller in that store, the bestseller. So the system knew for that particular store what the transfer of demand would be. That particular one. So that's pretty powerful. It means that we can now optimize for that store, but also the impact of you adding or removing other SKUs to that store. That's amazing. So that, yeah, data has a better idea, indeed. That's our tagline. 
So, so this is kind of a bit random. So I know you've got people in Japan. You mentioned you've got some people working in Japan. Cause that's yeah, we, a have big a, we have an office. We have an office there. We have about five people in Japan. We actually did a, um, if you went to a Vimeo um, channel, guys, if anyone's seen it, um, we actually done a, with Austrade and Dretro, which is the, um, um, which is the basically trading commission in Japan. They hosted a webinar um, talking about our experience in Japan. And it, it turns out there, there's not a lot of Australian companies in Japan, not, let alone startups <laughs> um, doing their thing. So, which was quite um, a, a, quite a good, uh, amazing honor to be asked to to participate in a webinar. So yes, we are in Japan. Yeah, because I could, because I mean, the one thing I mean, I'm, a, I have a, I have a, I love Japan. I have a bit of a love affair with Japan. Is the vending machines over there? They are incredible. The vending machines are just incredible. So is that something? Is that are they using this AI technology as well? Yeah. So yeah. So if you go, if you're in Japan and using the rail system, um, and you'll walk past a vending machine, most likely it's been optimized by Hybrid. That is yeah. so brilliant. Japan Rail um, is uh, Japan East Boiling Company, which manages the, the vending machine. Yeah. All right. Well, well it's on my, I'm dying to go back there, so I'm definitely going to check that out. So, so tell me a little bit about it was so, that was really amazing listening to all that. So, tell me a little about about leadership and how leadership for you being a startup and now the co-founder co-founder of this incredible growing organization like what does leadership mean to you and how's that played a part in in your role there at Highbury? yeah i mean look um well i, I can talk about how leadership is important where you have um, yeah. you know the common things about um leadership where it's all about vision and stuff like that and it, that that that's they've written a lot about that for but for me um leadership comes down to what i you know like um let's call it the cia and i'll, I'll talk about it's an okay. abbreviation it's being considered um showing integrity and and being actionable um they're the three things you know like that's my um uh ca um cia kind of and um I like, that a lot. I like that a lot yeah i love that yeah i mean what what if what if you break it down what it means is like considered is that you you consider people's opinion like any other leader you you look at you've got um you know direct reports that have views and passion about why they see either you know different you know if you're a cto reporting to the ceo you have a view on what 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 needs to be right so you consider their views um and but whatever you say yes or no you, you gotta demonstrate integrity so integrity means is what you say you will do um which leads on to the second point uh second you know a the a is action that you, you 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 whatever you say you do and you commit to do it um, um because that sh shows that you uh have consistency you know that in terms of your approach and people can know where you stand that that consistency translates to transparency and then that uh, follows down to the, the direct reports and then the organization uh, generally so people can operate with integrity are considered and I focus on action, you know, especially if you're a startup, which is important. It's not about um, thinking things through too much, you know. It's sometimes uh, inaction, it can be detrimental to a business. You just need to make an action and learn from it. So I love that. leadership, yeah, so leadership for me is, um, like I said, is, is being considered in their approach, uh, having integrity and, and um, operating with some type of sense of action, you know, um, sense of action is important. Because how many people now do you have working at Highbury? Uh, over four. Um, I mean, technically, it's um, forty-six point six, I think, um, because we've got some um, um, HR uh, person that works shared uh, shared shared time. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's but, incredible. I mean, can... Yeah, it's. It, I mean, we have a full-on leadership now. You know, think about it. Uh, we have. Um, <laughs> um, I got Ooh, some some um, I'll I'll let you manage a comment there. Um someone I don't know is that can you read that comment? Yeah, so I can't I uh, can't imagine uh how different our work would be if big uh big supplies generally build algorithms around increasing um impact of uh primary objective rather than revenue. Um being quick to support and grow 
uh, healthy choices? That's a great question um, uh, around healthy choices. In fact, um, we can, for the first time, engineer those healthy choices in the algorithms. So if, if our client said, you know, um, we want to ensure, and that's part of what, um, you know, companies in here in Australia, they do want to encourage healthy choices. So we can actually now, instead of be driven by, um, the question is, what, what healthy choices do you put that actually uh, helps the company which is revenue objectives or growth objective, but also the consumer. For the first time, you can actually have an opportunity to have that by featuring that the system will learn what type of, you know, um, let's call it um, orange juice performs per perfectly mm -hmm. or what type of water bottle flavours would work be better, that you can actually uh, feature those engineer, those particular rules called constraints, and it will provide the optimal um, um, assortment to cater for those rules. So that that's that is a great example of how it can be used um, um, for to to address uh, society concerns, but also meet business objectives as well. Thank you, and thanks for the question, Jen. That was awesome. That was a really yeah. really good. Question. So what what is your vision? Like where where what is kind of the long term goal, or where where are you taking Highbury? Well, I mean, um, we have um, the goal is quite clear at the moment. Um, there's these three products that we're, we just found, we finished a um, uh, last year. We closed down a, a Series A, um, um, eight million dollar raise, which I can talk about publicly. Eight million, uh, eight million on a pre valuation of forty million. Our investors obviously now are focused on us on on basically delivering our promise back to integrity. Yeah. Um, delivering our promise. So what we're trying to do is really focus on uh, exporting our product to US uh, with the QA because there's a big opportunity there. Like I mentioned, um, 900, 900 um, uh, million dollar problem, um, sorry, 900 billion dollar problem in, in assortment. So we want to really scale a curate product and also focus on Japan with our enhance our vending solution and start um, scaling those the solutions. And the final product, which I didn't mention, but it's more more important in Australia, is trade optimization, um, trade promotion yeah. optimization, called Hyvery Promote. And we just finished off a commercial agreement with um, Coco Amatel. Um, I don't know. Should be talking about customer's name. I forgot. <laughs> Get too passionate. Um, but that that is a trade. Actually, no, I like. It's actually there's a podcast on it, so you can listen to Melina talking about what we did. But basically, um, you know those two for one deals in Coles and Woolies. So we've got a we've got an algorithm that actually has modelled um, the behaviours of those campaigns. So you can actually run thirteen in advance and generate profit. Um, but for the retailer, so retail wins. It gets increase in in profit, but also now. Um, the manufacturer who's running those products because um, so, so it's a win-win again. Um, and I think that's really, um, I know there's some questions coming in, but it's kind of cool because at a high level, um, if we can get product assortment and promotion right, what does it mean at a high, high level? Is that we're, waste, we're reducing waste. That's what it means. And I think about that. So I went on when we started Hyvery and, and working out the problems that uh, um, that the companies uh, companies were facing, we were on safaris with um, a lot of our partners. So basic safaris, you go on on their trucks and visit them. So I remember one day we were going to a, a, a gas station and um, the products there they had a lot of Fanta, uh, you know, like and they were out of date because they weren't being sold. So literally we took them out because, you know, you can't sell expired thing, you know, product. So we really these plastic containers, we literally took them out and throw, um, threw them in the commercial bin. That is a waste of plastic, uh, water, uh, like you name it. You can. There's a lot of waste that happened there. But yeah. without technology, it's not going to happen. We're let, reducing that at least, right, because we're optimising at the hyper-local level. For that gas station, this is what you need, this is how much you need. And so at a high, that's what makes me really passionate about that because the more we get our product out there, you know, if you think about consumerism, is it one of the biggest culprit of, you know, environmental, you know, issues? Because we're, 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 we're converse. You look at ads on LinkedIn or whatever, uh, TV, yeah. encourage you to buy. So you buy, it creates this waste, waste. So what if I can tell you what you need, how much, and get the right products in the right hands? So that's ultimately what we're trying to do. I mean, that's sustainability and also reducing. I think that is such an issue for the globe around the amount of things 
yeah, as you said, consumerism, but also waste. Uh, especially, I mean, I think that's something that we need to be a lot more mindful of these days. Um, and also what happens to the things that, again, as you said, if they're not, if people aren't buying it, what else can you use? You can use with these products if people aren't buying it. It's like, you know, donating it to people that need it. There's so many things that I think that have a ripple effect around what you're doing, the work that you're doing as well, that can make mm. a difference to the world. Um, we're, at, we're at 30 minutes, I think. <laughs> I'm in wow. trouble now. But I could actually talk to you forever about this. I'm so sorry that I've taken more of your time than I said that I would no, today. I, I I've been talking. I, <laughs> I just go on my my. So apologies. I, I'm sure you had other questions that you want other, your your audience to to learn about leadership and so forth. But um, <clears throat> so Sonia, my bad. <laughs> oh, my Jackie. No, it was really fascinating. I mean, I just would love to ask one more question before you go for everyone that's listening. I mean, what advice would you give? Well, I mean, what advice would you give to others that have ideas or, I mean, obviously you're so, I mean, I'm, when someone gets asking me questions about the work and the work we do, I could talk about it forever as well. But what advice would you give for people that, you know, give for the future leaders or anyone out there that's thinking of starting a startup or want to make a difference to the world like you are? What advice would you, or what advice would you give your, your younger self around this journey? Um. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, look, I think the first thing you got you got to follow your passion because what yeah. sets uh, corporates, you know, executives apart from entrepreneurs is that they will spend millions of hours. They like me. I have my laptop at night. I will do stuff. At, uh, I'll go to a you know cafe, which I don't do anymore. <laughs> um, I should do more, but you know what I mean. Um, work. It's just for why I say it's passion is that you don't, you don't, when you're spending time on it, it's not like you're spending time. It's not work. It's just like, this is what I love to do. This is what I'm trying to solve. So you've got to have passion. That sets you apart from, um, from your, your normal corporate thing. The other thing is that um, find a problem worth solving, you know, uh, and it starts with you. What is your problem that you want to solve, you know, that is frustrating you, even in corporate level or um, in your personal life or even, I don't know, you might have pets. You talked about Frank or Frankie, right? What, what's frustrating you? Sometimes you wished you had a blah thing to solve that problem, whatever that is, right? Because, well, I'm sure that that, that the problem you're facing right there, I'm sure there's an, another, you know, thousands of people having that same problem. Mm. The difference is action, which is the last thing. Is man, stop talking about it and say, oh, that's my idea. I had that idea back in, you know, 1972. Yeah, but it, the p difference is this person took action and people are afraid to take action because it's like a risk. But that's why you have experimentation, having an experimental mindset. Just, you know, what is a, what I often talk about this when I lecture this at, at um, when I do my entrepreneur classes is be lazy about your idea. What is the most simplest way you can test your idea? You know, what is it? And you have no excuse. You can run a smoke screen page on LinkedIn, you know, to say, get see, determine if there's any, um, and you know, there's, there's many techniques. I don't go through that, but there's a whole class on that. But there's techniques where you can actually, um, yeah, you know, experiment with your idea to tr see if there's real value and you're solving a real problem. And the last thing is just have grit, you know, hustle, have hustle. Yeah, just do it. Just get yourself, ask people for help or ask people for advice. And I don't know, I just think life's too short. You know, if you've got, again, if you've got a, if you've got something you're really passionate about, an idea, just do it, you know, like, and just go for it. So I think that's really that action piece and that grit, like having that perseverance and passion around something is really important. So just don't spend a lot of money and time, you know what I mean? That's the biggest yeah. rule of thumb and, and learn along the way. So you say, okay, I'm going to spend $1,000. I want to get A, B, and C, and I'm going to test A, B, and C. What is it do you want to learn? That's the most important And when you start. Is that oh, I need to learn, do, is this product or ID has legs? All right, well, how are you going to test that? I'm going to create A, B, and C to test. Okay, that's it. That's that's your first step, and it will, it will, it will snowball quickly. It will snowball quickly. Well, I'm really proud of what you're doing, and it was a real honour speaking with you today as well. Uh, I'll, grab, I'll get the team to send you one of my books. Uh, oh, just yes, as a have it. You have it? Yes, I have. Oh, good. Was, okay. Yeah. That's good. They've obviously yeah. sent it to you. So that's really nice. So I hope you love it. Um, and we're, we're launching our 2021 Leadership Awards this week. Uh, 
and it's about celebrating and showcasing kind and courageous and inclusive leaders. So I'd love you to be involved. If you've got anyone you'd love to nominate a team or someone there at Highbury around that have been kind and courageous, I'll send you the information. It'd be great to see you involved with the awards. But it was such an honour and it was so wonderful speaking with you today. And thank you so much for being on the channel it's been and inspiring so many of us as well so there were some great thank questions you. and insights here so thanks again right. Frank. stay safe everyone you too take care stay safe everyone bye bye